Applications were put mainly by the developed countries, that's about 70, 80 percent. And the developers need the development space in order to and social problems. So the solution seems to be quite simple from an equity point of view. Can those that have already over-polluted and are already rich and can actually cut down, reduce their emissions very drastically? And it's like if one has over-eaten and you're already very plump, then it's very good for you to slim down even for your own health. And the fellow who is malnourished and starving to death should be given the space to expand so that he reaches the optimum, but should not go beyond the optimum. And the person who is slimming down is also good not only for the world, but for his own health. So from the point of view of food, that seems to be simple. And from the point of view of food, we have not even solved that. So we have obesity on one hand and malnutrition, and that's the same thing in relation to carbon emissions. The Bali Roadmap tried to change that because before the Bali Roadmap, we had only the Kyoto Protocol. We had the Convention and the Protocol. And an ad hoc working group for the Kyoto Protocol. I even attended that meeting in Bonn sometime in 2007. There was already a committee. Then came along a dialogue where they said there wouldn't be negotiations, a dialogue on long-term cooperation that was converted into a negotiation start in Bali with the formation of the LCA. It was not meant to replace the Kyoto Protocol. It was meant to supplement the Kyoto Protocol. So on one hand, we have the Kyoto Protocol. And then on the other hand, we have the LCA with the United States and the developing countries. So this was a bargain. You continue the KP into a second period with minus 40%. A reduction of 40% if you can, if not at least 25%. The US will do something comparable, perhaps not as legally binding as KP, but at least through a decision in the LCA. And developing countries will do more than what the convention asked them to do. At that time, it was only MRP. Okay. Now, if we had stuck to this bargain, then by the end of 2009, we would have concluded. KP2, the developing countries would have given up to do much more and the United States would do what it can. We may even forgive it if it cannot do what it should because we know the US is a special case. And this today would be the second, would have seen the second year of implementation of the Bali roadmap. But today we are still quarreling. And the shocking thing is that the anchor of that three-piece architecture, the Kyoto Protocol, is in danger. We know that this is the last chance to save it. Uh, the top-down approach of Kyoto is gone. We now have a pledge and review system. It may even be voluntary rather than legally binding. And the burden seems to be pushed onto the developing countries because besides MRB, we now have ICA, whether you're funded or not. And the two will be anchored on pledges of developing countries. So the developing countries have agreed to do much more than the convention, much more than the Bali Roadmap, and uh, it is on paper. And the developed countries have climbed down from a legally binding regime of KP into a pledge and review system of Cancun with KP in limbo. Unless KP makes a great revival here in Durban, where we say we go back to the original plan, then it may also disappear. Now in Durban, what we have heard is, let's keep KP somehow alive on life support. It's in hospital and the body is there, but uh, well, let's say that it is still alive and pump something in with three, four, five members continuing the EU plus maybe two or three or four. But uh, we will do it only in order to show the world that it's somehow still there. And perhaps not in the KP as an amendment to the NX, but as a political statement or a CMP decision. And the aim of that is to go into a new regime altogether. And therefore, you will hear that the big political debate 
in Durban is whether we launch a new Durban mandate for a new treaty somewhere in the future. It could be 2020. To the public, that sounds nice. Let's have a new legally binding regime and we create it in Durban. Well, what happened to the Kyoto Protocol? And what happened to the Bali Action Plan and the Bali Roadmap? This is like starting something new when something being discussed has not even completed its journey. Could it be that we have decided to ditch the Bali round into something of the future that we don't know what is going to be? And why do we ditch the Bali round? when we should have already concluded it and today we would have been in the second year of implementation. Are we ditching Bali, which includes the KP, for something better? Then I am all for it. We will all be for it. Or are we ditching it because we, we want to hide from the world that we have failed? That we have failed because we can't carry on KP, which is legally binding. We can't do a top-down science base, which is 25 to 40 percent. We are facing the reality of a pledge and review in which NX1 only does, if we are lucky, 15 percent, if we are unlucky, 6 percent, and if we are very unlucky, 0 or minus 6 percent, meaning they will increase the emission by 6 percent. This is because of the famous loopholes. <laughs> that will go on top of the low end of the pledges. You have high-end pledges with no loopholes. You have uh, high-end pledges uh, without loopholes. You have low-end pledges without loopholes. And you have low-end pledges with loopholes. These are the four scenarios of Annex 1. So low-end pledges with loopholes will give you zero or even a plus 6%. So many of the papers on the table will give you all the statistics. I think we are seeing here a great escape of the rich countries. It's a great escape from KP, it's a great escape from uh, top-down science. It's each country for itself according to national circumstances and we are very sorry. Climate is no longer uh, anything very important. Uh, you know, the recession is important, competitiveness is important. The world has changed. We now have China and India breathing down our necks and maybe taking over our economies and the world. So we cannot be talking about equity for developing countries. This is a kind of psyche change among the elites in the developed countries. So we face a dire situation and it's a, a confusing message because it sounds very nice to ourselves and to the public to say, ah, we are launching a new mandate in order to have a new international treaty that is legally binding. Well, if we legally bind something that is non-legally binding, that is a pledge and review system, then we are legally legitimizing something which is a climb down from what we now have. Of course, we can fool the world, because the world doesn't know all these things. I told you the four scenarios, high end, low end, with, without loopholes. Nobody knows what this is all about. Similarly, you can block the world that we have a, now a new treaty, but that treaty is legitimizing a pledge and review, which I don't even mind if the pledge and review has high ambitions. It has horribly low ambitions. Some countries in that pledge and review are pledging to increase their emissions compared to 1990. So this is the situation we now face. Uh, I don't think that we should launch a new mandate now when we have not completed Bali. And if that new mandate is another great escape, number two, we are escaping from Kyoto and now we are escaping from Bali into some new world of 2020 which is very far away when we should be completing Kyoto 1, launching Kyoto 2 and having comparable effort to those who don't join Kyoto 2. Uh, so this is something I think we need to really think about and discuss. Now, where developing countries are concerned, the developing countries, the big guys especially who have made their pledges, have actually pledged in terms of avoided emissions, more significantly than Annex 1. And there's a paper which is uh, very famous of the Stockholm Environment Institute quite recently that gives you the statistics of that. 
That doesn't mean that developing countries as a whole are doing enough. Nobody is doing enough. And every developing country should try to do more. But they face immense challenges because of this very limited carbon space that is left. Recently, we uh, managed to get some statistics on global peaking. We all want global peaking. In fact, the, the, the global emissions should have peaked not in 2015, but in 2005 or even in 1990. So the sooner the better. But what are the implications of global peaking for developing countries if we have global peaking by 2015 and Annex 1 keeps to its pledges, even the low end of the pledges, for example, without the loopholes? It would mean that the developing countries themselves would also have to peak, maybe not in 2015, but in 2017 or 2018. And peaking means that their emissions have to be reduced much more after that, all the way to 2050. Now, that's a wonderful scenario. I would like to see that happen. But can we solve the riddle of how to reduce your emissions? especially when you are poor, if your emissions are at 1 or 2 tons per capita, or 0 0.1 ton per capita, which is the case of some LDCs, can they reduce their emissions further than that, and at the same time hope to have social and economic development? The answer is yes, if you want to win many Nobel Prizes or the alternative Nobel Prizes. The answer is no, according to the present system we now have. Our present knowledge and model of development and technology. So we cannot accept the pledge and review ambition level which is too low. We have to ratchet up those ambition levels of NX1. The reason is they are the leaders. When they say leadership in the convention, it means you have to lead by example of cutting your emissions very drastically and you have to lead by providing the finance and technology that will enable the developing countries to do what they have to do. A few days ago, I said that uh, it's a miracle that the developing countries have to pull off. Actually, it's not a miracle. It's an impossibility that if they want to grow their GNP by 6-7%, even in a sustainable development way, and cut their emissions by 90% per capita by 2050 from business as usual, which is what they are asked to do, that is an impossibility. How do we convert what is impossible into a miracle? Because a miracle is more believable than the impossible. And how do you convert the miracle into a reality? There is no easy way for that. It's the most difficult thing in the world. I've seen these charts that say that business as usual for developing countries are like this, 4% a year emissions growth, which is a record for the last 10 years and their emissions have to go down by 90% per capita by 2050. So this gap is going bigger and bigger as time goes by and nobody knows how to fill this gap. So the technologists will say let's fill the gap with money and technology transfer. Of course that's easier said than done. Even money and technology transfer will not do the trick alone. But they are of course the essential means. And the money we are talking about uh, in the study that I've just seen on, uh, on this speaking year, is that the developing countries need something like 800 billion to 1.5 trillion a year for avoided emissions by 2020 if we are to have global peaking by 2015 or 2017. And the money is not near that at all. We don't have that kind of money. We are not, we are even talking about 100 billion by 2020 but with many, many hedges. Huh? We promise not to give 100 billion, not to mobilize 100 billion, but we promise to try to have a goal to mobilize 100 billion from all kinds of sources. Well, and that's 2020. So, we need to have progress in finance. The Green Climate Fund, if it is established, of course, ideally with democratic governance, mainly with public financing or the transact, uh, financial transaction tax, sufficient 
and that will really drive climate change actions in developing countries if we can get that. That would be one major step forward. We thought we got that in Cancun. This will be a major fight here because, uh, as our, uh, my colleagues will say, that there are problems with the substance of the design and there are problems with the process as to whether we will get it. For technology transfer, how can we change the minds of people to understand that technology transfer is not the importation and purchase of capital equipment Technology transfer is much more than that. It is to the ability to use that machine, the ability to adapt the machine to local conditions, the ability to make the machine yourself, even if someone had originated it, and the ability to design your own new machines. That is the value.